In any city, in any country, seek out any school or educational facility you can find. When you reach the front desk, ask to see the person who calls himself the holder of chance. If the secretary shows any signs of fear, give the request again and do not relent. Eventually, your perseverance will pay off and you will be led to a deserted classroom in a closed down wing of the school. Scraps of police tape and faded chalk profiles will litter the floor and the door will be sealed behind you before you can inquire anything. At this point, you must choose one of the 30 desks. Sit down and wait. Only one of these desks will allow you to keep your life. Advising you to choose wisely would be little good, as there's no way to tell if you have done so until it's too late. After a short wait, you should begin to hear things. Children laughing, droning lectures and the occasional snore. But these are merely echoes of a time when the classroom was host to nothing more devious than homework and pop quizzes. As you wait, the sounds will slowly change. Where there was once laughter and lectures, there will now be screams of agony and howls of despair. Shades of the classroom's horrible history will begin to take shape around you. Do not fear the shapes as they are harmless. The beast they can coalesce into, however, is not. As your wait continues, the shadows will grow more numerous and the classroom's history will unfold in increasingly gruesome detail. This part has driven many men into fits of tears and more still into madness. Should you reach the end of this macabre production with your sanity intact, you will find out if you have chosen wisely. If you have chosen incorrectly, the shapes will take form. They are hideous mockeries of what they were in life, half-formed doppelgangers of those long dead. There is no escape from this room now. They will tear you apart ever so slowly, taking twisted delight in inflicting the pain they have suffered on someone else. It will take you days, perhaps even weeks to die, the only consolation you will have is that you will likely lose your sanity after the first few hours. If you were lucky and chose the one correct desk, the shapes will gather around you, coalescing into a pitch black mass. When it disappears, you will find yourself in the most lavish casino imaginable. It is populated by those who have played the game so long that their flesh has long since rotted away, for death is forbidden from entering this casino, and yet still play, hoping to gain their freedom. The casino has but two exits. One leads to a wasteland where fell beasts roam and nothing but certain death awaits. The cost to pass through this is four silver coins. The other door will take you to what you seek, and it's the only chance for you to leave with your life. The cost to pass through is five gold coins. You will be holding a single silver coin in your hand. Don't fret. As long as you are in this casino, you can never have any less than this one coin. A nearby sign will tell you that three silvers equal one gold. You must play if you do not wish to be trapped here for good. But remember the old casino boss's idiom. You can't beat the house. Nearly every game is rigged in favour of the house and the precious few which aren't change at random, serving only to trick and confuse you. The odds are most definitely not in your favour if you do begin to win, take care to keep your fortune as secret as possible, as the damned around you have not been so lucky. Bear in mind that you cannot die in this place and that boastfulness may inspire them to turn on you in a fit of jealous hatred 
ripping great chunks of flesh out of your body until their jealousy is quenched and their bloodlust sated. If, against all odds, you manage to gather the five gold coins to enter the door unmolested by the other gamblers, you will find yourself in an elevator. It will take you up to an office even more opulent than the casino below. Behind the desk at the far end of the room will sit a skeletal figure, dressed in the finest suit you will ever see. Approach the desk and stand before it, asking only one question. Will you roll? It will nod and produce a pair of dice from its jacket. Call the roll, evens or odds. If you lose, the skeleton will grin and you will take its place, waiting thousands of years for the next seeker to be so lucky as to reach your new abode. If you should win, however, it will let loose a whale that will unbind the magics that hold the place together. Death will finally enter the casino below granting the wretched gamblers the rest that has for so long been denied them. As the casino disintegrates around you, stand perfectly still. Hopefully, you will not be taken with it. But if you are, there is no being in this world who can say what will happen to you. If you are not taken, you will reappear in the classroom. It will be exactly the same as you left it save a mound of dust and rotting cloth at your feet. Within it, you will find a pair of dice. As soon as you touch them, the door will unlock. That pair of dice is object 75 of 538. With every roll, they take another life. Will yours be the next they claim? In any city, in any country, go to any mental institution or halfway house you can get yourself to. When you reach the front desk, ask to visit someone who calls himself the Holder of Sanity. The receptionist will look at you strangely, but you must repeat the same question and nothing else. Eventually, she'll call for a doctor and you'll be taken to the room in the furthest corner of the institution. Beware. But after this point, there is no turning back. And if you wish to leave then, tell the doctor that you are sorry and you must not have taken your medication today and leave. Run as far away as you can. Outside the city limits. Outside of the country limits, for cowards are not spared if caught. If you continue on, you will be put into a straitjacket and locked in a padded room. After a few days that will seem like months, you will start to hear voices. Hundreds of them. All talking about how their lives were ruined. Their stories may drive you mad. And you would have to stay there for all eternity. For in your padded room there is no death, only torture. If the voices stop talking, close your eyes tight and shout at the top of your lungs, I will not share your stories. If the voices do not resume, Pray that the pain you will next feel will not be so bad, however unlikely that is. As the voices continue talking, single out the voice that speaks of the very hospital you are in. Listen to his story and open your eyes. You will not be in the cell anymore, but still in a straitjacket. Instead, you will be in what seems like an endless void. The only thing separating you from the void, a glass box. A man will appear in front of you and ask if you have any questions. He will respond to one and only one question. Ask what drove them to insanity. He will explain in horrifying detail about the lives and deaths of them. During his response, a large black dot will appear to be moving through the void. But you must not focus your sight on it, for it will shatter the glass box, leaving you to fall into the void for all eternity. Once the man has finished his story, he will remove your straitjacket and bid you farewell. You will find yourself standing outside the institution, holding the straitjacket. The jacket is object 72 of 538. You can only pray that you may never wear it again.
in any city, in any country. Go to any schoolhouse you can get yourself into. Go to the principal and ask to see the holder of angst. If they hesitate for even a second, you're in the right place. If they refuse to acknowledge your question, ask them again. Eventually, they will grudgingly give in. They will take you to the basement of the school. As you are descending the steps, a feeling of uncertainty will wash over you. No matter how you try, the feeling will remain in the back of your mind, growing stronger with every step. The principal will lead you to the farthest corner of the basement. The closer you get to the corner, the more light is sapped out of your surroundings. With the light goes all feeling of hope. They will frantically start brushing the cobwebs and dust off the walls that connect at the corner. Once they complete this, both walls will have a brick with an indent just big enough to fit your hand into. The principal will leave without a word, and it will be clear to you that you are on your own from this point onward. You will have to decide between the two walls. Be careful though, as one contains horrors beyond the human imagination, while the other leads you forward. Either way leads to regret. If you manage to pick the door that leads onwards, you will see a dark, musty corridor. It will be darker than anything you may have thought possible. But walk in a straighter line as you can. If you collide with something warm and vaguely human, stop moving. Do not move, or else you should regret your very existence. If you remain still, the warm blooded mass should vanish, as if in mist. Once this happens, speed up your pace. You will eventually think that you see a light, but it is simply a trick. Do not go towards the light, for if you do, your very essence shall be in peril. At the end of this tunnel, you will feel what seems to be a door. It will be reminiscent of a medieval dungeon with a small barred window and a wooden plank keeping the door from opening. Once you've made it this far, there is no turning back. You cannot do anything other than unbar the door and walk inside. Once you pull the door shut behind you, there will be a deep voice in your ears, speaking a language you will not understand. It will sound as if it's everywhere and nowhere, and its incomprehensible words shall chill you to your bones. Do not move, do not speak. Wait until the voice is done, until you so much as breathe. If you do not follow these instructions, your last sounds shall be tormented screaming. When the voice finishes, wait a moment. Turn slowly and face the holder of angst. He will be wearing torn strips of cloth and his body will be scarred. He will look at you with eyes so full of grief and sorrow you may almost cry yourself. Do not. He will start speaking about his life, but his voice will be but a whisper. He will describe torments too horrific to understand. Terrors that will make your ears bleed, but listen. Listen and do not close your eyes or cover your ears. For you won't need them if you do. During his story, he will cling to your shirt and ask you to help him escape his personal hell. Stay silent as this is but a ruse. Once he is finished, he will curl into a fetal position and sob quietly. You have only a small amount of time until his crying drives you mad. Ask him, what will happen if they are brought together? The holder will be standing, even though he was just in a ball on the floor. His face will contort with an odd mix of rage and fear. He will run around, throwing unseen objects around the small, empty room. You will hear porcelain, glass, even wood break and shatter around you, even though there's nothing there. He will be ranting loudly in a language that was not meant for human ears. Again, wait. Stay still and silent until his fury is released. The moment he is done, he will sit down. He will begin to explain the reasons why they should never have been created the atrocities that they have caused and the unimaginable power they contain. He will stop on occasion, to sob or throw another imaginary yet real object, but he will not be done. No, his madness has been driven too far, too deep to be done in a matter of minutes. He will speak for what seems like hours and then days, 
Those days will turn into months and then into decades and into millennia. You must not falter, no matter how long it seems you have been standing there. Once what seems like an eternity has passed, he will stand slowly and walk to you. He will lightly touch the sides of your head with his palms and knowledge will flow through your very being. The holder will look at you with a look of blissful relief as his madness has finally left him. The moment you blink, he will be gone. The knowledge he has given you is object 501 of 538 and it must never be reunited with the others for reasons which you will now fully understand. This understanding will eventually drive you to insanity. I used to see him often. Well, I guess I shouldn't say him. More like it. Then I moved away, to another state, another city. I don't see it anymore. Not physically, though it creeps through my mind in its swooping, slinking way. High up in the air one moment, and then sliding across the ground the next. Over and over and over, its limbs propelling it forward. The mere thought sends ice-cold shivers running down my spine. It used to watch me, but it can't anymore. At least, I don't think it can. I wouldn't be surprised, however, to wake in the early hours of the day when the sky is still dark and look to my window to see those eyes, those teeth, see it smile, that awful smile. I hope I'm dead before that day arises. I hope I've seen the last of that monster. When I was little, I lived in a small suburban neighbourhood. It isn't the kind you're probably thinking of. Big white uniform houses, all lined up in perfect rows with green lawns and two garage doors. No, my neighbourhood was much older. It was built sometime in the 50s. Every house looked different, but most had started to fall apart. People living there were hard-working and honest, for the most part and their long, hard lives showed on their faces. No one really talked to anyone else. That was one of the only things I didn't like about that neighbourhood. My mother always said the neighbours just liked to keep to themselves, that they had nothing very important to say anyway. Looking back on it now, I think they did have something important to say. Something very, very important. I saw it for the first time when I was eight years old during the summer. It was very hot that season, unusually so compared to all the summers I've had since then, so I'd stayed inside most of the morning. Then, after lunch, my father hooked up the sprinkler we used for our garden in our backyard. I excitedly got into play clothes and rushed outside into the blinding sun. Those were the days. Those innocent days in the sun where I played without a care, I had no idea I would soon be missing them. So, I was outside, running and laughing and jumping through the cool spray of water, when I saw it. At first, I didn't notice it. It was just a rustle in the bushes, and it was the crack of a branch, and I looked up. Something, something dark moved through those leaves, something as black as midnight. Yet it shimmered when the sun hit it. It ran, or galloped to this day, I'm still not sure what to call it, from a small forest behind my house, leapt over my neighbour's fence and disappeared from my view. I was curious, so I chased it. The pavement burned my feet, but I didn't care. I watched, along with a few other neighbourhood children, as the creature swept in and out of the shadows of trees making its way down the street. It was large, probably about eight feet tall if it stood upright, though it never did. Instead, it stayed hunched over, its hind legs curled up at its sides, the knees protruding grotesquely past its torso. Large, white, curled claws grew from bony feet and long slender fingers. 
Its arms were gnarled, the joints bulging under twisted muscle and skin. Skin that was black and rubbery, stretched thin over whatever bones the beast had. It caved in at old places and almost looked as if it were rotting. Still, when it crept through the sun, patches glistened grey and blue, as if it were made of some kind of foreign glass. Then there was its face. The skin was the same, stretched over an oblong oval skull that jutted out in the back. Its eyes were sunken deep within its head, large round and hollow. They glowed a weirdly white yellow, one I'm sure doesn't even have a name to this day. Really, it wasn't even glowing. It was more of a pulsating, ever-present light that seemed to come straight from some non-existent soul deep within the monster's core. It always seemed to smile. Its mouth was stretched like its skin far across its face. You know the expression, grinning ear to ear? It was literal in this case, each corner reaching each side of its face where ears would have been if it had any. Within this smile were two rows of pure white teeth, long and sharp. In fact, each tooth was so long it could never close its mouth. The sharp tips just clacked against each other as it skulked around, waving its head slowly from side to side, as if sniffing something in the air. I used to find this silly, since it had no nose. Now the thought terrifies me. We kids just watched it in a sort of dazed amazement, never having seen something like it before. I suppose I thought it was just some species I'd yet to learn about in school. I wish that's all it had been. Then our parents called us back inside for dinner, and we grudgingly obeyed, not wanting to get in trouble. I'm not sure about the other kids, but I never quite forgot about the creature I'd seen. I got preoccupied with other things, sure, but its image was always in the back of my mind, burning there, waiting for me to remember it late at night while I tried to drift off to sleep. It got its wish. That night, I was lying in bed, with my covers pulled up to my chin despite how hot it was. The nightlight across the room barely gave me comfort from the thoughts of ghouls and ghosts hiding in my closet or under my bed. Then, the beast's image slipped into my thoughts. I gripped the covers. It hadn't scared me before, yet I'd been mere feet away from it. But now, after having the image sit in my mind all day, my brain registering its unworldly appearance, I started to fear it. It was bad. I knew that now. Then I heard a tap. I froze. Another tap. I didn't dare move. Then there was another, and another, and another. It was at my window. I could hear its long claws scrape across the glass, hear its razor-sharp fangs as they clicked together. I could hear its breathing, heavy, husky, in and out, in and out. Finally, I could no longer bear it. I tore my eyes from my nightlight and gazed through the dark room towards my window. It smiled when it saw me, an impossibly huge grin that split its face in two, white teeth glistening with saliva gleaming eyes seeming to pull every fear from my conscious and unconscious to the surface. I screamed. By the time my parents rushed into my room, it was gone. No traces of its existence left behind. They said it was just a nightmare. It wasn't just a nightmare. I never saw it in the daytime again, but I saw it every night. After a week, I stopped screaming. I just cried silently in my bed. Then, after another week, I stopped crying. I knew I was scared. I wasn't going to give it the satisfaction of seeing me tremble. It wasn't until it found the lock on my window that I was truly terrified. I'll never forget the clunk the lock made when it had been moved for the first time in years or the waning screech of the window as it slid open, or the heavy breathing at my bedside. 
I'll never forget those eyes as they gazed at me from beyond my covers. It knew I was scared. It thrived on that. It wouldn't leave me alone. Everyone says I went crazy, but I didn't. It just wouldn't leave me alone. I hardly ever slept. My hair started to fall out and I always looked tired. My parents put me here in this psychiatric hospital. It's a nut house, that's what it is. I'm not crazy. It's been years, years. The nightmares still happen when I do sleep, so they keep me here. I suppose I like it better this way though. After all, the monster can't get me here. You know, the funny thing is, I can't even remember where I used to live. I can't remember the state or the city. I can't even remember the country. I will be the first to admit that what I did in my youth was monstrous. But that is no reason why I must be afflicted with such nightmarish terrors. It is inhumane to live like this, but I will not be forced out of my own home, built by my own ancestors. I am an Alvarado, the last of the richest family in Guanajuato. So what if nobody wants to work for me anymore? Ignorant peasants. I have enough money and rifles to outlive whatever it is that afflicts this hacienda. But, as brave as my words are, my soul cannot match them. I fear. I tremble when the sun goes out. It is out there. It is here. It is everywhere. The horrendous beast with its large yellow eyes and the surrounding dark void. It cannot be described further. A demon. I feel like it is its duty to kill me, but not a quick death. It wants to make my life unbearable. It wants me to do it the favor of killing myself. I have seen it once or twice. I have shot at it, no effect. It is like shooting at twisted lights or shadows. If it was just my fear of seeing it, I would have taken it. But it screams like the cat it once was. It yells like the little girls I have murdered. The demon cat of one of what? It was the eighth year anniversary of my brother's disappearance. My parents, as usual, sat by the fireplace, mindlessly rocking back and forth in their rapidly deteriorating redwood chairs, wallowing in their never-ending sorrow. I could never understand why people bothered commemorating such devastating events. It always seemed like such a waste of emotions to me. But in spite of their pain, day after day, they took blame for what happened, encasing themselves within a makeshift tomb constructed of past regrets. Why did we let him go? Are we bad parents? Was it our fault? I knew, though I desperately wanted to disprove it, that most of the blame befell upon me. I was supposed to watch him that fateful night, the night of that accursed show. I was granted temporary responsibility of being his caretaker, and I had failed miserably. I yearned for the chance to relive that night. Maybe I could have kept a better eye on him, or held his hand so he wouldn't get lost. The tragedy of losing a relative at the age of ten isn't something you forget. But, at the risk of sounding egoistic, it's not something I want to reminisce either. Despite how much it pained me, however, I wanted to learn the truth. I wanted answers to my parents' unending questions. Questions that forced tightened cuffs upon their psyche, trapping them within their mental prisons. That moment came when I received word 
that the same puppet show that caused our burdens would be returning to town. I would finally receive my answers. Being the ripe age of 18, I had no problems acquiring a ticket to the show on my own. I decided against notifying my parents of my whereabouts, knowing that if I told them, they would forbid me to go. It was just as I remembered. The building for the performance was decayed and putrescent. Its walls were stripped of most of its paint and vibrant green vines lengthened along its sides. The inside, however, was the complete opposite. The walls were adorned with red and black coloured wallpaper. Posters and stringed lights decorated the room. Small chairs gathered around a large wooden stage, draped behind scarlet red curtains. It was like walking into an old, abandoned building, only to be greeted with a beautiful oasis. The show wouldn't begin for another 30 minutes, although many were already arriving. I took my seat in the far back and waited patiently for the show to begin. Aside from a few subtle changes and the addition of new puppets, it was the same show that I had experienced in my childhood. My eyes swelled up with tears at the thought of my brother. I had found it difficult to focus on the show any longer. Just as I was ready to make my departure, one of the puppets caught my eye. It had soft, curly brown hair and eyes that shimmered with the brightest pools of blue. It had uncanny resemblance to my brother, a carbon copy of how he looked right before his kidnapping. It even bore the same clothing as he, jean overalls draped over a white shirt. I was dumbfounded. It had to be a coincidence. Rapid thoughts flashed through my mind like multiple bolts of lightning striking all at once. Could this man, this puppeteer, be the one behind my brother's disappearance? I needed to find proof of my disquieting discovery before pointing blame. I had waited for the show to end, and while he was distracted with autographs, I stealthily snuck away to his dressing room. I was surprised to find the door unlocked. I cautiously twisted the knob in my trembling fist, my heartbeat steadily increasing as I ascended into the room. Silhouettes of marionettes hung from the ceiling and sat among the many shelves the room held. A sliver of light beaming from the hallway illuminated the room only slightly. I trailed my fingers along the wall in search of a light source, my hand eventually coming in contact with one. I flicked the switch, only to be greeted with the most haunting display. My stupefied gaze was not met with the sight of marionettes, but with children. Children who were reported missing from neighbouring towns and cities, all gathered together to partake in the puppeteer's demented puppet show. Many of their limbs had been amputated and stitched back into place, eyes gouged out of their sockets and placed in jars, soaking in an unknown liquid, their mouths cut to their ears and sewn shut. Drips of dried blood leaked from their orifices. Some had their heads decapitated from their bodies and attached to that of a doll's. I swallowed hard, forcing down the vomit that erupted from the pits of my stomach. I stared, awestruck at the hellish sight I was now witnessing. The ability to move had left me. I heard footsteps quickly approaching my location. I spun around, only to have my eyes meet with the puppeteers. He was holding my brother, or what was left of him. I wasted no time in sprinting away as fast as I could. I was relieved to hear the absence of steps behind me. As soon as I arrived home, I called the police. My parents, noticing how frantic I was, kept questioning if I was okay, but I couldn't answer them. The police arrived about a half hour later. I was too distraught to give a detailed statement, but told them as much as I could. Three days later, they were able to capture and apprehend the puppeteer. The remains of the children were all returned to their families and allowed a proper burial. The puppeteer was given death sentence for his crimes, scheduled to take place within the next 20 years. As of late, word had gotten out of his escape from prison. 
Somehow, before escaping, he managed to write out my name on the cell walls with his own blood. No one knows how he learned my name. I opted to stay anonymous for the duration of the trial and did not appear in person. The cops guessed he was able to get a hold of the police records and recognise my picture from my encounter with him. If that's the case, then my faith is now entrusted in the protective agency and the reassurance that our location was well hidden. I just hope it stays that way. <laughs>